Hello everybody, welcome to a live stream. I'm your host Chris, I'm also the artist that's about to be drawing. I'm doing Inktober. So I'm drawing something every day of October following the official Inktober prompts and I'm giving myself the extra challenge of trying to make it relate to a horror movie. Today's prompt was Tread. That made me think of Cars and that made me think of the horror movie um, Christine. And uh, that was, uh, well, it's also, now that I think of it, like a horror novel, but uh, I'm definitely thinking of the movie first, if I'm being honest. Uh, directed by um, John Carpenter, uh, adapted from a Stephen King story. And uh, yeah, it features this badass 1958 Plymouth Fury, which is just sort of uh, evil. And uh, yeah, anyway. Let's see, some folks are starting to filter into the uh, chat room. So, hello, Iron Shell, Roman, Atomicus, Sheldon, Franco, Compared. Nice, look at all these folks that are here. Hello, Terry. Um, so, yeah, I've got, like, my, um, my, my sketch basically ready uh, for inking. And uh, let's see, who else has joined us? So, uh, we've got Who's the Mac? And, uh, by the way, folks, huh? Eh? Maybe I can set it up a little better, but look what's back. Hello, what is this? We've got the cheeseburger back in the uh, background. So uh, Chrissy set that up after hearing several people asking where it went. Hello, Fernando. So I'm going to start with this uh, character in the foreground, and then we'll uh, progress to the car itself. Drawing vehicles is a lot of fun because... Uh, you can really play with like the shadows and the highlights and stuff like that and as long as you're consistent uh, you can be pretty creative with uh, what you decide to do and it'll still look right whereas when you're drawing people beyond just being right with the light sources you know you, you have to get the details right because people will subconsciously be able to tell when a when a person doesn't quite look right but a car uh, not always as easy to uh, spot if something's a little bit off. So you can be a little more creative. Another late night. Kinda. And um, by the way, as soon as I finish this, folks, jumping right into uh, working on um, wrapping up the next uh, comic tropes. I know that I didn't upload one this morning. Uh, just really behind because of like having to work late um, a bunch this week. And uh, what can you do, you know? Um, I gotta, gotta earn my living, so had to make some tough decisions to uh, just sort of go like, okay, you know, I'm gonna stay late, that's what's gonna earn me money, and I'm gonna have to just uh, be a little bit later with uh, the next episode. I do think I should be able to finish editing it tonight as soon as I finish doing this. Take me a few hours, and the episode should be up uh, uh, pretty late tonight, at least late by Pacific standard time and uh you know what can i say it's it's better than like you know just taking the week off just going to be a little bit later than it has been sometimes but when i first started the show my goal was just to have it up before monday and somehow that just sort of kept backing up until it was like first thing sunday basically so anyway uh, we've got Chibi meowing again for some reason. Not sure what's up with her today. Uh, let's see. Hello to uh, James and Sheldon. Uh, hello, son of a red shirt. Um, nice to have so many people in here. Hello, Daniel. So uh, anyway, uh, moving forward, g gonna do my best to make this drawing look kind of nice, and then we'll, uh, after about an hour, I will uh, take a break and go uh, wrap up the episode. I think you guys will like it. I, I think I've uh, made a good one. I just need to finish editing it is all. But that really is the most time consuming uh, stage is, is locking all that in. Um, at the end of the month I should be able to give everybody a little bit of a bonus of, a, of something. Um, I uh, acted in a uh, short horror movie that some local fem filmmakers made. And um, 
I'll be uh, that that I believe that's going up on YouTube right at the end of the month, and I should be able to share that with everyone uh, that that's curious. So uh, yeah, I play a fairly serious uh, role in it. I'm I'm just a uh, psychology professor in the movie, so. Uh, I'm not super tied into the main plot so much as I'm like sort of the exposition guy that's setting up some of the premise. But uh should be interesting, right? I am drawing Christine, yes. Hello, Corey. Um, many buckets, hello. How did you learn to draw? What's the story? Pretty much the same as anyone, just, just drawing all the time and trying, just always working to try to improve. Uh, I still got a plenty of long journey. Uh, but uh it is fun not trying to pass myself off as uh, some big shot professional or anything just on the uh, journey of learning to be better same as uh, same as most uh, out there oh my cat Milo's meowing too okay well they're just sort of playing I get it that's why is this the film for Crypt TV. No, I don't know what Crypt TV is. Sorry, I don't know what that is. Yeah, it's a short film. It's not a full length, uh, like you know, hour and a half or anything. It's something like uh, twenty minutes, I think, maybe a little less. But uh, I, I haven't seen it yet. I've seen some clips from it, and the cinematography looks gorgeous. I will say that, like the the cinematography really impressed me. So. I think these guys worked very hard on it, and it was it was definitely a fun like challenge to do something a little bit different. What's your favorite comic book writer? Mine would be Mark Miller. Hey, Joe, uh, my favorite comic book writer. Um, might be Ed Brubaker. Um, I also really like Jonathan Hickman. I'm mostly thinking of guys from today. You know, there there was a point at which it would have been Frank Miller or Mike Mignola. Uh, still love Mike Mignola's artwork uh, and and tend to like what he writes. Um, but you know, in terms of like interesting plots with you know cool character development and catchy dialogue and stuff like that. I don't know. It, Brubaker's work definitely speaks to me. And the plots that Hickman comes up with tend to really engage me. So, I don't know. Might be one of those guys. Garth Ennis? No, it wouldn't be Garth Ennis. It would have been in the 90s, maybe. Uh, hello, Blue World Comics. Uh, hello, Watchful and Harmonious Subscriber. People getting killed in horror movies is usually the highlight. Definitely, definitely. Chris Claremont, I loved him throughout the 80s. Loved him. Huge. Favorite novels. Um, I really like... Uh, um, the Amazing Adventures of Cavalier and Clay. That, that really spoke to me. Um, I remember crying at A Tale of Two Cities. I enjoyed that one. Uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy is a classic that I've like reread a bunch of times. Uh, I don't know. There's lots of movies. Uh, movies. I meant books that I like. Turn the music down a little. Uh, I definitely like Stephen King. Yeah. I wouldn't say that every single book he's written is like my personal favorite, but uh, in general, I, I definitely enjoy Stephen King, and I've read a lot of his stuff. I think overall my favorite might be The Stand, but um, I'm a big fan of his uh, um, Dark Tower series. I really like the Dark Tower.
Wow, thank you, Beta Ray Bingus, and welcome to the chat. Um, uh, that's really kind of you. I got a super chat from uh, Beta Ray Bingus. Really awesome. What's the guy doing in the drawing? Stealing a hubcap? Uh, no, this is going to be a detective just sort of like inspecting the car closely. Um, I'm drawing this based off of the movie version of Christine, which means this is uh, sort of my attempt, and he's kind of small, but like I'm drawing a... Oh, what was the guy that played the detective? Um, Harry Dean Stanton. Really great actor um, that we lost uh, last year. And... Uh, just had a really amazing like face and just appeared in a lot of amazing movies. Alien. Um, uh, uh, Repo Man. Um, Twin Peaks. Uh, Avengers. <laughs> Wasn't Christine a 58 Plymouth Fury? Exactly right. Hello, Rednecks Bricks. Um, my favorite car from hell. It is a gorgeous one. What a what a what a clever choice on on many levels. Like you know the the, the name of the car alone, Plymouth Fury, sounds dangerous, and uh, you know it, it it's a, one of those muscle cars from the fifties that like. Uh, has a cherry red exterior that like really kind of kind of lends it an air of menace within the right context and basically like anything in the 80s that was directed by John Carpenter it's uh it's really good and a lot of fun Possibly my least favorite of what John Carpenter created in the 80s, but I like my all time favorite horror movie could well be The Thing, so that's you know, it's not saying uh, anything too shabby there. Oh, Magic K, thanks for the super chat. Which Jason Todd's origin do you prefer? Um, I think the original one where he was stealing the hubcaps from the Batmobile and Batman was just like, nah, I'm not going to bust this kid. I'm going to make something of him. I'm going to give him an opportunity and, and, you know, maybe a better life. And, uh, yeah, I think I like that. He was, he was... He was so different from the sort of perfect goody-goody Dick Grayson. Uh, it was a nice change of pace at the time. And I mean, now there have been a bunch of Robins. But it was a good idea to make him quite different from what we had before. What other questions? Uh, what's my favorite comic book of all time? Mm. That's a tough question that I, I don't have a good answer for off the top of my head. You know, there was a time when it was uh, a Preacher when I was younger. There was a time when it was Blankets by Craig Thompson. Um, and, and I still really do like those, but I also like a lot of, like, crime stuff that's come from, uh, uh Ed Brubaker in more recent years than that. Um, uh, shoot, it's, what, I, I, I probably do have something, you know what, maybe Hellboy, though, overall, just for the art, I don't know. 
it's always hard to pick your favorite, you know? You feel like you're excluding something that you really love. Um, I just rewatched Spielberg's Duel yesterday. Yeah, Duel is dope. Duel is dope. I honestly gave uh, that Peterbilt uh, truck uh, a little bit of thought for today's drawing, and I just ultimately felt like drawing more of a sports car. But uh, Duel is uh, better than any TV movie has a, any right to be. It, it, it's totally worthy of being on the big screen because of how invested you get with the characters and his adventure, his, his story. Creepy. It's tough to name a favorite comic. It really is. Hello, Benjamin. What did I miss your new comic? No, you didn't miss Comic Tropes. I'm still editing it. I'm, I'm, it'll pro be up uh, probably real late tonight. Um, I just uh, been really backed up with work and uh, was not able to hit my self-imposed deadline of real early on a Sunday. Uh, and I just sort of made the executive decision that like, so I could have had it ready like first thing in the morning, but I would have had to sacrifice my entire night's sleep um, instead, I just sort of stayed up till, you know, something like three or four and was just like, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna get my sleep and then I can, uh, I can just finish editing it tomorrow night because I, I just, I just need my sleep. I, I, I'm not gonna, I'm gonna make a mistake if I tried to do it. Um, I always try to get ahead, but it's really hard. I, I work a job that like, requires me to put in more than 40 hours um, I sell cars and so I only get paid if I sell a car I don't get paid like an hourly rate or anything like that what that means is if I want to make money uh, then I have to sort of work around the customer it just means that usually I have to stay a little bit later uh, to wrap up deals or come in on days off uh, and and that's just what's required if I want to make money. Um, so that can be kind of tough, but that's what I'm doing right now. And uh, unfortunately, that just means that, like, you know, even though Comic Tropes, Tropes is super important to me, um, I have to prioritize, like, what kind of work I have in front of me. And, and uh, I got to be able to pay my bills. So I wish I could have uh, had it ready earlier, but it will be ready today. Just just real late. Um, I'm not punishing myself. It's a self-imposed decision, Sigmigs. Um, and by the way, welcome. Um, you know, I, I want to... It's important to me to keep a, a weekly schedule. It is work to do comic tropes, but it's work that I enjoy. And it, it's only really worth doing if I can, in fact, keep to a pretty regular schedule. At the same time, you know every sort of like you know show that's produced takes time off I don't take much time off I um I've been looking at my schedule and uh, I'll probably need to take one week off around the uh, either the end of November or the beginning of December one of those weeks um, just because that's when I'm going to Japan I can like record up until I leave and uh, and that'll be good and then I can record an episode while I'm there which I'm planning to do and like continue once I get back but there is sort of like this middle ground um, between the last episode that I finish and like the first several days in Japan um, I want to be able to enjoy my time in Japan it's really important to me so what I plan on doing is taking one week off um, either the end, last week of November or the first week of December, not sure which yet. But I'll take one of those off, which, come on, people are taking off anyway because of Thanksgiving, typically. Uh, and what I'll do, though, is since I'm there in um, Japan, is I'll probably try to make several sort of small videos about just what I'm seeing, like especially like as it relates to comic books and collecting and stuff like that uh, and I will try I can't guarantee it but I will try to do a live stream right there in Japan um, 
that's very kind of you, watchful and harmonious subscriber. Thank you. And hello, Snark. How much is a trip to Japan? Well, typically it can be pretty expensive, but the reason we're going this time is uh, we got some really great uh, flights uh, well ahead of time. You know, we saw a deal where it was a uh, 500 round, tip, round trip for the, uh, for the airplane, and I said, like, 500 for a trip to Japan? I mean, I know we have to pay for a hotel and food, but... There are ways to do that, like, sort of on a budget, especially since we've been there um, a couple times before. I was like, I, I want to do it. I really like it there. Um, that It relaxes me. It makes me happy. It makes Chrissy happy. So we're going to, um, yeah, we got we got ourselves uh, plane tickets for 500 each, um, which I honestly consider pretty darn good. A trip to Japan. How long is the flight? It's hard to remember. Um, because before I've always sort of flown directly to Hong Kong and then gone over to Japan, but it might it might be 12 hours, something like that. Speaking of Japan, will I make a manga episode? Well, I definitely covered manga before, um, but I will be um, recording something special over there, uh, talking about an important manga, and uh, and taking advantage of essentially the scenery. Um, trying to make the most of uh, the trip. Um, I hope to book a space to record the episode at YouTube uh, Space, which is YouTube studios that are in that city. Um, I have permission to do so, but we're having trouble finalizing some of the paperwork. But I've still got like uh, over a month. So I'm, I'm pretty sure I can work it out and I'll be able to... Um, record an episode uh, in, in at the YouTube studios when I go to Tokyo. So I'm pretty excited. If you had the chance, would you leave America for Japan? If I had the chance, Yosup, I, I actually would. Hello, a uh, bunch of people have joined. Uh, let's see. Carabear, Mr. Vic, welcome. Um, Chris, will you ever show off your Hot Toys collection? I definitely want to. And hello, Jojo. I don't think I said hello to you. Jimmy. Um, yeah, I definitely want to. My plan for showing off my YouTube, my, my YouTube, my Hot Toys collection is, um, now that I've moved into a new house, new, and yeah, it's still new to me, um, I want to get some of those, uh, stand-up glass cases. Um, I don't know how else to describe them, but hopefully you know what I'm talking about there. And, um, you know, put them in there, and that would allow me to display them permanently in a in a well-lit area and down here really and then I could easily show you I could make a, a small video just showing my collection because it is pretty sizable at this point um I don't know book off I don't think I know book off rebel leaf I could read a lot of comics on a flight to Japan and I hope to I think I'll probably also bring my Nintendo switch because I haven't gotten to play that a whole lot Make sure you don't visit Japan during the Godzilla season. I actually do plan on going to the Godzilla store. It's small, but there's a dedicated Godzilla store uh, in Tokyo. And uh, I've been there before, and I really like Godzilla, and I like the store. You can find some just sort of unique uh, merchandise there. And uh, I do intend to go there. I've also got like a, a close friend out here who's a far bigger fan of Godzilla than I am, and I know I could make his day if I just pick him up something small from the Godzilla store, doesn't it? I think it'll mean a lot to him. Book Off sells uh, used manga for 100 yen. I'll look up Book Off, definitely. And I definitely plan on hitting, like, uh, Mandarake, uh, especially the one in Shibuya where I'm staying. I've been there several times. I like it. I can find some cool stuff there. And I'm going to go to Nakano Broadway. Nakano Broadway is a really amazing area that sells lots of, like, manga and stuff like that. So, yeah. Magic K, thank you so much. Uh, manga re recommendations. JoJo's Bizarre Adventure. I'm starting to read that now. I've read the first volume. Akira, I own that. Read it. Love it. Um, Alita Battle Angel, Ghost in the Shell. Uh, I've seen the anime for Alita Battle Angel. I've not read it. Ghost in the Shell, I did an episode on. So, um, yeah. Going to check out Studio Ghibli Museum. Uh, it's mostly a museum. Not not. It's got a store, but it's mostly a museum, Sheldon. Um, probably not this time. I have gone before. I have been to the uh, Ghibli Museum and 
what an experience. It's it's gorgeous. It's so special there. Um, just amazing. You go in and the first thing you do is they show you one of, they've got several short films that they've never like released in theaters outside of the museum or onto like DVD or the online. You can only see them at the Ghibli Museum. And they give you a cell from what you're seeing, like a, reproducti a reproduction cell. So that's a treat right off the bat. You get to see a short film that's original in like their own really lovely studio. Uh, like, not studio, um, like a movie theater. From there, you go on to learn about like the history of like animation. You go through rooms in like what's sort of made to look like an old house almost, but, but like big and whimsical and fantastical. And you learn step by step the process that goes through creating their movies. Uh, we're talking about like how they write their scripts, how they gather reference, how they paint backgrounds, how they animate, and you can like learn about like how uh, you know like animation all works. It's really really amazing. They have statues, they have restaurants. It's all Ghibli themed. It's hey Gene, nice to have you here. It's really lovely. There's a horror movie cat in the background. There's a burger in the background. I would say that my favorite Ghibli movie is also uh, Spirited Away, Jaden. So anyway, um, yeah, big, big fan of, uh, of Ghibli in general, and uh, uh, Chrissy is as well. Um, we've gone to see uh, most of the movies in the theater, and we own a few. She was, um, my fiance is a painter and she was invited to a group art show that was all based off of like Ghibli characters this past uh, summer. So we sort of went on like this, uh, uh, she hadn't seen too, too many of the movies and we, um, we went to see like Porco Rosso in the theater and um, Howl's Moving Castle, um, Kiki's Delivery Service, oh, tons of them, tons of them. Your cat walked by earlier. Yeah, there's Milo. He, he, can you can see a tiny bit of him? Oh, he's here. He comes. Come here, buddy. This is Milo. Does Arby's make burgers? I don't think they do. I I've n I don't think I've ever actually been to an Arby's though. But I think that they may have chicken. But I think their specialty is completely. Uh, what do you call it? Um. Roast beef. Pretty sure that that's about all they do. I don't think they do burgers. Why'd that come up? I called my sister today because I'm out, I was at work and we allow people to bring their uh, dogs in and somebody uh, brought in a one-year-old border collie and uh, Years ago, uh, right after I graduated college, um, I was living back at home for a while, and my sister was as well, and she adopted a Border Collie that became a true beloved member of our family. Uh, he was named Oreo, so we, we, we he, he was almost one when we adopted him, and we kept that name. But Border Collies mean a lot to us because of how much we love that dog. And I saw this one-year-old today, and she was something special. I, I just had to call up my sister. I was like, I saw the coolest dog today. Oh, she's so pretty. Here's a picture. <laughs> There's nothing more to the story than just I saw a dog that I thought was pretty. Um, she was um, one of the somewhat more rare uh, brown dogs. Uh, border collies brown and white uh, most of them of course are black and white now, some of them have a little bit of color but not not as many as uh, other breeds I don't know how many of you all are uh, dog people but I like dogs and I and I I like certain breeds of dogs a lot I, I, I love like I don't know I love all sorts of dogs these days I used to be very afraid of them actually because growing up, um, I'd been bit 
by dogs several times and it, as, as a child, and it does make you a little nervous. Not, Gene says not that rare. I mean, fair, but I haven't seen tons of them. And, uh, yeah, so, like, growing up, I'd been bit by a couple dogs, including um, our own dog. Like, as a child, I, um, like a toddler, I don't even really remember this too well. I remember the emotion behind it, but I don't really remember the full experience. But basically, I, um, I fell down our basement stairs, and our dog, Ginger, was at the bottom, and I surprised her, of course. I mean, just all of a sudden, this kid just, like, falls off the side of the stairs and, like, you know, lands next to her. And she got scared and bit me on the nose. And growing up as a little kid, I, I did have some small marks on my nose for, for for a while. They eventually sort of faded away, so I don't really have any scars there. So I'm kind of lucky. But uh, So that happened, and then I had a paper route, and I got bit twice by dogs on my paper route. Just sort of like getting older um, dogs, like little ones. But... uh. You know, it did make me nervous about dogs. And when my sister Jean adopted Oreo, he was just so loving and obedient. Uh, and I got into the habit of taking him for uh, evening walks as soon as I got home from my job. And uh, we would go for walks in the woods together. I don't know. And I just... He really changed my mind about dogs. I, I, I really grew to trust and love them for how wonderful they can be. So a bunch of new people uh, jumped in. Let's see. Hello to Ham. Hello, Jeff. Delivering the paper can be kind of rough. It could be. Um, you know, I grew up in uh, Massachusetts, and we get some pretty hot summers, but really get, like, plenty of snow in the winter. And uh, those were tough days. Like, you know, I had... I essentially had two paper routes, but like, you know, I just did it all at once, but like, because it, it was all for the same paper. It's just that I took over a second paper route almost as soon as I got my first one. I took over a second one from some guy. And um, what I'm getting at ultimately is just that, uh, so it would normally take me an hour to deliver all the papers on a good day. But during the... Uh, during the winter, when it would snow, it would take me like two, two and a half hours to get that all done. And tough, tough work, you know, it, it really was like it was walking up and down hills and through yards and in some pretty uh, tough conditions. So, uh, you know, I have I have respect for people that, you know, do paper route stuff. Um, you know, there, there are adults that will do it for a living and uh, it's a lot of work, actually course less and less of a thing as we get older and less people read uh newspapers but uh growing up it was still like a very big thing there was no internet so newspapers were way more popular and it was hard work let's see hello d kiki uh hello francisca hello mr stupid and wrong paper delivery in arizona is the easiest job well that's cool that's cool yeah, this is the car from Christine. This is a 1958 Plymouth Fury. And uh, just sort of bouncing around, filling in details as uh, at whatever sort of catches my eye. I guess I'm sort of working from the bumper towards the front. I think I'm actually going to use my ruler for some of this. Uh, let's see. Hello, Austin. Hello, who else? I like doing the crosswords. Yeah, I like doing that too. Is the Messiah playing in the background? Yep, by Handel. Good to hear, Gene. I try not to play it too loud. Hopefully that music is not distracting. Uh, there will be a new Comic Tropes this week, uh, Jeremy. Just expect it real late today or depending on where you live. You know, like first thing in the morning. Um, I just... Uh, I'm just behind due to work. I, I was already telling a story about it. Kids today are too lazy. I don't I don't know. I know some pretty hardworking younger kids. I think that there's plenty of uh, hardworking kids out there. Let's 
I'm usually not like somebody that listens to uh, religious music per se, but I do tend to enjoy a, a pretty wide variety of classical music every once in a while, and that just is what I'm in the mood for tonight, and uh, a bunch of it is royalty free, so I, I'm like, oh, I can have some background music for a change, you know, it's, it's what I feel like listening to. <clears throat> An 86 Dodge Dart. That would be a car from hell. Uh, not the most reliable. Uh, <laughs> this reminds me of Christmas concerts in high school. <laughs> yeah, you know what? Um, I haven't seen um, wa the Watchmen show on HBO. I don't have HBO right now. But um, a lot of my friends that work in comics, that, that whose opinions I trust, told me they were surprised at how... Um, sort of relevant and uh, well done the uh, first episode of, of Watchmen was so I have to admit I'm curious it's, I don't really like want to support something that like Alan Moore is against but you know maybe that's just his problem and I should be okay with watching it I don't know it's not like I owe him anything but it just feels like it's tough to support sometimes. My favorite classical piece is Beethoven's Fifth. Totally. That's a good one. What comic book artist do you think cuts corners the most? Cuts corners the most. Well, you know... Not exactly throwing somebody under the bus. I, I think I'll just sort of like repeat what I've said in some episodes before. And I think that like uh, in terms of cutting corners, that's sort of uh, what Greg Land does. Um, I don't think using reference in and of itself is any sort of a problem. But I think he's started to become so beholden to reference that he will only draw from existing images. And if you go back and look at his early work, he was definitely a capable artist drawing stuff from his imagination. So I think he, that's a type of cutting corners, it, it, you know, because um, he redraws like faces and poses that he's already drawn before. And of course, any artist is going to draw similar stuff, but it doesn't necessarily mean they have to draw the same stuff. Um, I don't have a problem with the reference. I used reference for, for this car, you know, for, for a car or something, I, I get it. Um, or if you're even just looking at something to get like, a, you know, a likeness right or, or, or something like that, totally makes sense. But I do feel like all he does is trace. I feel like a hypocrite because obviously I've done a little bit of that today. But also, I don't consider myself a professional, and I'm using this specifically to work on my inking techniques. Which I definitely still need plenty of uh, practice on. Take a look at what kind of questions are being asked in two seconds. All right, what do we got? Um, Gustav Holtz, The Planets. Yes. Mars. You listen to... The planets, and you're like, and then you listen to say um, the Star Wars themes, uh, and you're like, oh, I see what John Williams was doing. <laughs> yeah, Watchmen is in an alternative, alternate universe uh, where some different things happened from like about throughout the eighties. Yeah, you could argue that Liefeld cuts corners, but I don't know that he cuts corners. I mean, I think he just hasn't, like, put in much effort to evolve his, his work. You know, he just still is doing work the same as he always has. But, what can you say? I mean, dude, dude sells, so... Get where he's coming from to some degree. Some of the stuff is a little too rounded for me to actually uh, use my ruler.
The show is supposed to be a continuation of the comic. Yeah. Uh, have you heard the Superman is revealing his identity? No, I haven't heard about that, but there's a story that hasn't really been told, so yeah, let's see where it goes. There's always a way to uh, reset things to the status quo in superhero comics. Sometimes there's a writer can do it cleverly, sometimes they do it like kind of blunt, but if you're patient, like, things get reset, so you might as well just sort of see what kind of new ideas a writer spits out. Sometimes they're good, and if you don't like it, even though it's canon, you can basically uh, ignore, I've found, the runs that you don't care about too much, and you can still enjoy uh, your favorite superhero. I don't know if Superman's identity was revealed before. They can reset Superman by having him sell his marriage to Satanish. Exactly. Well, Satanish is uh, still Marvel, but... Uh, Neron, right? Isn't Neron the, the big demon of um, DC's superhero comics? Christine is funny because in the book, King describes it as having features not found on that model or car. Oh, see, yeah, I, I, I don't think I uh, read it then because I definitely don't know about that. That's funny. But you know what? I can always chalk that up to that weird owner that sold it to Arnie. Maybe he had modded it out somehow, right? You can do almost anything you want to a car. What would happen to Spider-Man 2099 if in real time it's 2099? Would we just ignore it in the comics or what? I don't think Spider-Man 2099 is necessarily going to be relevant in like 80 more years. Uh, I wouldn't I wouldn't consider that a big concern. probably been asked this but what pen are you using yeah somebody asks uh but regularly but it's okay um i'm using a brush pen by uh sakura i need to get a better camera at some point but anyway that says sakura and this is their pigma brand f for fine brush i've got some mediums and yeah just sort of swapping back and forth between them it's about time to get some new ones but uh it's what i like working with Hola! Fiance walking by. It's funny to think 2099 will be a real date someday. Yeah? Space 1999. Yeah, there's a difference though between setting something in the near future and something in like the far future. And, uh. You know what's one that like dated itself really fast was, uh. Uh, Demolition Man, Sylvester Stallone. It's an action movie that I actually really enjoy. But it was, like, set in the pretty near future, all things considered. And it was, like, not the most plausible. It was inaccurate within, like, I think a year of them making it. Because uh, a bunch of criminals are getting out of cryo uh, stasis. And Wesley Snipes' uh, villain goes like, Jeffrey Dahmer's in here? Let's let him free. I love that guy. Jeffrey Dahmer was, like, killed in prison, like, within, like, a year of that. But whatever. I don't think it 
stops you from it being able to enjoy the movie for what it is. Blade Runner, yeah, maybe that one was that one wasn't set far enough in the future. Uh, don't forget that we've already fought Khan, Nooney, and Singh's genetic Superman and survived the nuclear holocaust which followed. That's right. So, like, in Star Trek, uh, famous villain Khan, uh, when he first showed up in the uh, TV show, The Space Seed, they refer to those, like, uh, the, the um, you know, mankind going through the genetic wars in, and I'm forgetting, but I think it was the 90s. It was something like that. Like we shot right past that and I didn't catch any genetic wars <laughs> hey Texas Grizzly thanks for jumping in idiocracy is coming true that's the truth thoughts on ROM Space Knight so much better than it has any right to be considering it's based on just like one single toy that like having seen it is not really all that impressive like and yet the comic is a blast. It created so much mythology and stuff, supposedly based off this one toy. I, I think, I think Rom Space Knight is really cool. Actually, I think it's a, it's a treat. As far as like adaptations from like um, toys go, it's way up there. My my personal favorite is for like a comic adaptation based on a toy. Is going to be Larry Hama's G.I. Joe. Because I, I really enjoy that one. Um, I think he did something really special with that. Made me believe in those characters in the comics first. And like, you know, the toys were just sort of like, oh, that's cool to have too. And the, like the cartoons, like, yeah, that's cool to have. But like, to me, the comics are like, in my head, like, that's the main thing. That's my head canon. But after that, like, I didn't really ever love, like, Transformers were a toy line that I loved as a kid did not really love the comics um but rom space knight was great they yeah um rom is owned by somebody other than marvel all the support sort of elements that they introduced in there like dire wraiths that's something like marvel still has access to but um but not like rom himself which is slightly odd just because he was bouncing around like the 100 percent marvel universe for quite a while but that's what happens you know it was the same with Conan for a long time. Mar Marvel had elements of Conan's like mythical like wizardry and stuff like be part of their comics. For instance, like you know the X Men went up against the sorcerer Kulan Ga Gath. I may be mispronouncing how you, however you're supposed to pronounce that wizard's name. Um, but now Marvel has the rights again, and all of a sudden Conan is in an Avengers book. So you know. Some of these characters disappear and then come back. <sighs> Captain Action had a short life. That's true. Uh, comic based on the 1970s G.I. Joe toys. Did they have toys in the 70s? I mean, I guess in the beginning of the 70s they did, but they were mostly in the 60s. Um, hello, let me be honest. Kind of hello, Bo Bormac? No. Bomac. Hello, Bomac. Hello, Mix. Um, Conan isn't public domain by now. Nope. Nope. Definitely not. Conan the Barbarian isn't actually that old. 
He isn't near like nearly as old as something like uh, you know uh, Tarzan or anything like that. He's way more modern than that. Yeah, I don't remember what year. Um, uh, you know Howard created um, Conan without looking at it, but my best guess would have been the fifties. Maybe it was earlier. But that's my guess. It's the, somewhere in the 50s. Astro City. Uh, that would be a good TV series. Sure. I agree, Mr. Vic. Uh, let's see. who. Let's see what else. Um, my dad loves the G.I. Joe comics. Well, so do I. Hello, Wolf Whiskey. Um, Vampirella went public domain. I don't think that's right. I, I think only Dynamite has the rights to um, Vampirella. Yeah, at nine. Is it nine? Oh boy, I get it. My cats were meowing because it's time for their second dinner. We we feed them twice a. Thank you, Chrissy. And thank you for putting up the hamburger. I've pointed it out a couple times. We've got the hamburger back. Conan is public domain. Oh, really? Conan was was created in the 30s. Oh, that is 20 years earlier than I was thinking. That is interesting. That's... Things that enter the public domain get, get really confusing because even once the character enters the public domain, of course not... A specific company's interpretation of that character does so like yeah um, the idea of the Transformers could theoretically like fall into the public domain one day but not Hasbro's specific versions of those characters um, and then Disney of course is constantly working hard to extend how long copyright lasts Hmm. I did not know that Conan was public domain, so that means that more than one company can use him right now, not just Marvel? My favorite Conan artist is John Buscema. Totally agree. He's the best. But um, this guy Mahmoud Azrar uh, definitely did some gorgeous work on him. Uh, that that guy's a talented, uh, you know, emerging artist in comics. Um, maybe some would probably argue he's already uh, fully established. But yeah, that guy's that guy's talented, man. What are you looking for? Myra. My cat doesn't want to eat his medicine. Oh. <laughs> I'll be right back, folks. Just making sure my cat eats his medicine. Thank you. My fiance is down here helping uh, feed the cats, but she didn't feel like being on camera, which I think we can all completely understand. You don't always want to do that. <laughs> Have I ever had an interest in Robert Crumb? Um, yeah, and I admire his artwork and his style, but I think that his sense of humor has not aged well. I don't think it's... Uh, it's kind of weird. It's It's a little uncomfortable I think today but his his place in comics is earned and uh, there's a lot to say about him so I'll definitely make an episode about uh, Robert Crumb at some point and what he contributed as an artist to the comics industry
Universal alone has the rights to any films based on Conan. And some someone says Conan isn't public domain. Well, seems like we're not going to solve this one tonight. Since I'm uh, actively drawing right at this moment, I can't take time out to uh, look it up and confirm one thing or the other. Uh, and it's just not something I know off the top of my head at all. Yeah, I think Universal may have also been responsible for that Cull movie. Controversial question from S. Michael Harden. Traditional art or digital art? Um, I wouldn't say that I necessarily have a preference. Uh, I, I personally enjoy working in both mediums. And I think that there are artists who can produce gorgeous work in both mediums. So, you know, like, for instance, Brian Boland was, was and is a fantastic illustrator, okay? He used to work traditionally. Um, for quite a while now, he has worked only digitally. And I don't think you can actually tell much of a difference. Um, you know, good luck identifying when the exact moment was that he switched over uh so it's it's always just sort of um down to the artist himself uh i i think either is a is a totally fair way to work i don't think that one is necessarily uh easier or prettier than another i think that like you know there's there's a wide variety of uh cases on both both sides Kevin Sorbo in a Cole movie. Yeah, and it had like modern hard rock music if I remember correctly. It wasn't that good. The question is, is Conan O'Brien public domain? Conan O'Brien is completely in the public domain. Anyone can make a Conan O'Brien talk show. I'll uh, pop my head up in just a moment to see what else is uh, being discussed, see if it can take me down any story tracks. I like telling stories, like, rather than just answering, like, you know, and I don't mind being asked any question, but, like, um, you know, they're like, well, who's your favorite artist right now? I'll, I'll try to, my best to come up with an answer. But I like open-ended questions that might lead to stories, because that's where I feel that I can be the most interesting and funny is telling a story but let's see batman and superman go public domain in about 10 years we'll see what happens though you know um i have a hard time imagining like time warner is going to give up those characters they have ways of pressuring uh well basically lobbying the government to make adjustments to those rules uh, do, 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 do. One day soon, you're going to be able to create artwork just by thinking about it. Uh, 
Who's the most annoying comic character? That's always going to come down to people's personal preference and what they like and don't like. Uh, yeah, I can't think of a character off the top of my head that I'm just like, annoying. You know, I don't really have time tonight to color this, but I think this is one that would really benefit from uh, just just even like a, a, a red. Maybe I will take a moment to, to put red in, but let's see how the inking goes first. I, I gotta, I'll go for a little bit longer at least. Um, we'll see where it goes. Guy Gardner, Ambush Bug, Batmite, yeah. I kind of agree with you. Uh, uh, let me be honest uh, that like lobbying is essentially bribing. I mean, it, it, I don't, I've never completely understood why it's allowed. I've never completely understood it. Um, I understand like, you know, that like interests should have representation, but I think, uh, but the fact that they can, like, you know, gather money and essentially, like, buy a vote from a politician is not right. People should have votes, not companies or organizations. So, you know, like, if they want to spend their money making ads or something or, you know, educating people on their position, that that's one thing. But to just, like, be able to spend a certain amount of money... Uh, taking like you know a senator or a representative on a trip it, it, why is that why is that allowed i don't i don't understand why it ever was established as an okay thing i, I don't i don't get it <sighs> hello nick i'm new to your channel love the history and humor are you an artist yourself oh well, i mean in this sense, I mean, I'm drawing something. That's about it. You didn't like Dr. Smith in Lost in Space? I can sort of understand that. Um, I I found him an, a, a bit annoying, but also pretty funny. Uh, the thing I found annoying about him was more just that, like, the writers sort of let him take over the show and, and it was like well this guy's not really a threat anymore it's yeah While I'm putting a few highlights on the window, it's kind of important to me that I actually black out a, a large amount of this window because I feel like the less you can see sort of in the driver's seat gives, gives it a little more of an ominous feeling. Maybe I'm not successful there, but that's at least what I'm th my logic is, 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 you know, really black out the interiors because that's sort of almost, almost the face of the car. Hello, Carlos. Has anybody seen the new Lost in Space? I, I have. I like the new Lost in Space. I'm also a little biased towards liking uh, the original Lost in Space because the guy that played Major Don West went on to become a um, substitute teacher and uh, we would sometimes get him. And when I found out like we were getting this guy, I would start watching the Lost in Space reruns and I was like... It was almost like having somebody along the lines of like, you know, Luke Skywalker or Buck Rogers to me, like when I was young, I was like, that's so cool. Like it, it really felt cool to me that this like guy from a sci-fi show like that was like the teacher. No, not the Lost in Space with Mott LeBlanc. I'm, 
we're talking about we're talking about basically the other two versions the original version from the 60s and then the uh the new netflix version uh they they, they rebooted it and it's really cool and grounded um good family drama uh i liked it a lot there was a lot i was surprised at how much i liked it um characters are constantly in danger there's a big mystery about like what the robot is and where he comes from and i liked i liked the design of him uh, i didn't find any of the young kids annoying or obnoxious it's pretty easy to do i definitely found them a little annoying and obnoxious in the original show and in that terrible live action movie that they did in the 90s Lost in Space, a 60s television series before that Matt LeBlanc movie. Yeah. Bill Moomy is a super nice guy. I've heard that. I found 60s science fiction and fantasy quite special in the sense of being whimsical and a sense of wonder. Yeah, I think that there's a lot of, like, 60s sci-fi. Like, I like Lost in Space. I really like Star Trek. And I really, really like Doctor Who. Those are all shows that came from the 60s. And one, one, one thing that I think is cool about them is... um. You know, they did not have big budgets or access to too much in terms of special effects. So it meant that the writers had to be clever about, like, how they would try to use their limited resources. And then on top of that, like, they expected the audience to sort of buy in a little bit. Like, you know, use your imagination a little and just say, like, hey, I can tell that's a set. But I get what they're going for, so I'm just going to go with it. And if you sort of, like, just committed yourself to going with it, they could tell some amazing stories. And I especially thought that they were incredibly ambitious with Doctor Who. Like, their, their aliens were often, you know, not even up to the quality of what they could do on Star Trek. They, they In the early days, they were not necessarily impressive a few of them stood out you know and they're the ones that are still around like the daleks cool weird look the cybermen were pretty pretty great looking from the beginning but they really did challenge you the audience to to buy in and like just sort of go with it and i kind of like that they were just like yeah i'm gonna tell like a huge epic story and you're just gonna have to go with the fact that we can't fully realize that like we're just gonna do our best yeah that's what we were just talking about gene mark goddard was a substitute teacher and he was uh he was the um um what was the character's name on uh, on lost in space the one that wasn't in the family aside from dr smith he was um major don west he was Major Don West. Yeah, he was an awesome dude. Oh yeah, the 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 series uh, The Prisoner. I love The Prisoner. Definitely got a little weird after like you know like um the first I don't know we'll say that there were sixteen episodes because I forget the exact number. First ten are rock solid. Then they get kind of experimental. Um and then it, like I I do think it ends on a pretty interesting uh, note in the end. Um. Um, I like The Prisoner. I like The Prisoner a lot. It was a weird, cool show. Major West, good. Um, there was a Prisoner comic. It was a little interesting, but it was made, like, well after the 60s. It was just made by, like, you know, almost fans. I forget who published it. I forget even who worked on it. It was a little interesting, but... um. Yeah, they've never really been able to capture quite what made it work, like with because the, they also tried to make sort of like a TV movie reboot on uh, AMC once with uh, 
Serene McCallan and uh, who else? Uh, I don't know. A couple other like actors, but like nobody like I guess that's a huge name. Jim Caviezel, I think, was the main guy, if I remember correct. I could be wrong. It was interesting, but not great. It's kind of boring. Be seeing you. The cool thing about the prisoner is you never really learn exactly who he is, certainly not why he's being held on this island of prisoners. The premise is that like every week some mysterious person in control is just trying to break his will and get him to become part of the community and hopefully I guess share whatever secrets he knows something like that it doesn't really matter exactly what what matters most is it's a battle of wills and this dude will not get broken no matter what techniques they use like every episode is like you know a different attempt to either break him or get him to befriend somebody that like you know is trying to get information out of him and he just never falls for it it's a, it's awesome he his will is indomitable Working on the grill here. Was the prisoner the show with the giant bubble that ate people? Uh, yeah. Yep. Was... I am not a number. I am a human being. And uh, that dude was actually uh, American, which is kind of, like, extra interesting. But, yeah. What was that actor's name? Now it's now it's eluding me. Um, you may also remember him as the pretty evil king in uh, Braveheart. And he before um, uh, he did uh, The Prisoner, he was on a very popular 60s, very much more traditional spy show called Secret Agent Man has a very memorable uh, theme song um, but he was always more interested in doing more experimental stuff and that's why he did the prisoner Patrick McGowan Patrick McGowan and Patrick McNe McNe the two greatest Patrick's from the 60s yeah so Patrick if, if, as long as I'm remembering right Patrick McNe was um, uh, from the Avengers, and Patrick McGowan is from uh, The Prisoner. The final episode of The Prisoner sort of gives you closure, but it's it's a very surreal episode, so it's very open to interpretation. It's it's a it's a tough one to like truly uh, comprehend. I'm not sure I really do, but uh, it is interesting. It's certainly very interesting. What you meowing about, Chibi? You just got your dinner.
the British Avengers, Secret Agent Man. The Prisoner is on uh, YouTube? I didn't know that. It's interesting. Sadly, we're all just numbers. But that's sort of like uh, the premise of The Prisoner is to like sort of say, you know, even if we are, you don't have to like, you don't have to accept that. Retain your individuality. Fight against uh, all structure. You know? Resist. Do what. Do what's right. I don't know. Anybody out there have a car right now that they absolutely love? The reason I ask is even though I sell cars, I cannot decide what to get myself. I've, I've paid off my old car a while ago now, and I see so many cars, and they each have like big pluses and stuff, and I, I just cannot decide. So I sincerely would be interested to hear if anybody out there is like, I love my car because of XYZ. If you really love your car, let me know. Hi. Yeah. Talking to my cat a little. Right, I'm weird. What is your main concern with a car? I would say, and that's a good question to ask, you know, is uh, I want something comfortable that sits high, has uh, some nice safety features, and good, decent fuel economy. You've got an i8? Wow. An i8's nice. An i8's real nice. An i8's real, real, real nice. Let's take a quick look here. I'm gonna just make sure it's the car I'm thinking of. Yeah. Yeah, the i8 is... Ooh, that has a lot of horsepower. Whew. Uh, that's way out of my budget, though. Something like that, even if it came onto my lot, is going to be like close to $100,000. So, Jeep Renegade. Okay. You like your vehicle? It's good to hear, Selena. Toyota Tacoma. I would love to have a pickup. I don't know if it makes sense, but uh, I would love to have one. Uh, we already have a Hyundai, Jeremy. We have a Hyundai Tucson Limited. It's pretty new. Um, so I want something else. Probably still an SUV, though. Nissan Frontier. Love it. Love it. RAV4. I've looked a little bit at the RAV4. It's not bad. Not bad at all. You've got your brother's Crown Vic Police Intercept. Ooh. That's got to have a great engine on it. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that your Subaru broke down. I would say that like today's Subarus are a lot more reliable Carabair. I, I I really would say that, and they're really good at holding their value. But um, I don't know. I'm making YouTube money. I ain't making the kind of money that can afford a uh, i8, folks. Look it up. It's you know it's not quite a supercar, but it is. As far as like what BMW is making right now it might be their nicest you buy one of those new you're, you're gonna be spending basically somewhere around a hundred fifty to a hundred seventy thousand dollars I'm sure most of us don't have homes that cost that much so don't think I'll be getting that anytime soon I would personally like to get a Tesla, but um, that's also not realistic within my budget right now. 
public transportation is really cheap. Honestly, I would not say that like we have great public transportation in Washington. Um, maybe if you're like right in the city, the buses are uh, pretty darn good, but uh, I am not. So I would not say that like it's anything special here. Uh, and that's, but you know, I got spoiled. I lived in Boston, I lived in DC, and we have subways there. And they have problems, but the subway can really get you around almost anywhere. Like a, a city with a subway, I like that. Use a skateboard. All the YouTubers these days have a Tesla. Well, I want to fit in, so I'll see what I can do about getting one. <laughs> Tesla's not completely unrealistic, but I'm not looking to spend to my upper limit of what I can afford. I'm looking for something nice and comfortable. I was just curious what people liked, and you know, I got some things. It's interesting to hear what you guys like. Uh, Toyota RAV4, uh, Nissan Frontier, Toyota Tacoma, I get it. A 58 Fury, there you go, yeah. I'll just get that. It just puts itself right back together. You know whose inking style I really admire? Um, he's an artist named Jeremy Bastion. He does a comic book called Cursed Pirate Girl. That I think is incredible. The only reason I haven't really reviewed it yet on my channel is that it's not finished yet. Um, it's a really amazing sort of fantasy that I think would classify as all ages, but uh, I enjoyed it big time, and I think that like a lot of people would. Um, he's got a really gorgeous inking style, like really fine, delicate, but super detailed. Um, I don't know if anybody else out there has read that comic. It's good. It's real, real good. Cursed Pirate Girl. Yep. A Jeep CJ7. Uh, CJ7. Let's see. Oh, okay. I see. I, I see what you're talking about. Reason I wasn't super familiar is, uh, I don't carry that at like my dealership and uh, um, yeah they stopped making them like uh, by 86 um, now we have the Wrangler and I have looked at actually at like a, like a Wrangler uh, Unlimited I think that that might be a, a pretty fun car to own definitely a comfortable car uh, it's one I would strongly consider um, it's the only Jeep I would consider still want the Batmobile. Uh, another people say they want the Batmobile. <laughs> A space car. Thanks for the compliment, James. Um, that's funny. <laughs> Let's see.
So Robert Pattinson is the actor who's going to portray Batman in the upcoming uh, movie by director Matt Reeves. I was looking at an interview um, where he said he didn't know how he could play a superhero, let alone just a hero. You know, like that's the, you have to like find sort of like who the character is as compared to just making him appear perfect and uh i had to admit that like everything he was saying the way he described it is better than what i'm doing right now and i was like that makes a lot of sense you can't just sort of look at like what batman has accomplished in at like his best and and just play that that, that would be impossible you have to like ground it with like you know some sort of like real world um wants and desires like to truly understand what that character is i, I don't know I, I i liked his thought process on that i have to admit I, I hope he does a good job and i think i've mentioned this before but he appears in this uh drama from like a, a year ago called good time basically a type of a crime movie it's really really good it's really good so i recommend it Christian Bale was the best Batman? It's hard to say. I, I thought he did a great job. I thought he did a great job. Sounds like he's overthinking it. I don't think so. I think that you have to understand your own character if you're going to play some, a, a role. And to just sort of say, like, you can't, it, it, it is hard to just sort of say, hey, I'm a superhero. That, that's, that's not something, like, relatable. You have to understand, like, what does the character want? And, and why does he want it? And from there, maybe you can, like, you know, make him do heroic things, but, like, he has to have a grounded reason. It's, it's hard to describe, but I, I really liked the thought process of what I was reading was all. But I wouldn't ever accuse an actor of necessarily overthinking their performance. Now, of course they could, but it wouldn't be something I'd accuse them of because that's their job and that's what's up to them and that's how they need to make it work and however they need to make it work is however they need to make it work um i think acting and actually being convincing is is a very very tough thing to do I don't think any of the Batman movies have ever played up the character's detective skills. Uh, not enough for me either. I would love to see him truly crack a mystery. I mean, he's used detective skills. Like, he's used, uh, you know, skills to, like, match bullets and, you know, do analysis and stuff. So it's like we're being told that he has those abilities, but we don't really focus on him the same way we do in like a mystery where like you know somebody is actually putting the clues together and we're trying to do the same thing as we're following along um, I, I think that would be um, interesting to take a crack at a Batman movie where he really is uh, and and it would especially work with a character like say the Riddler like that, that he ha he isn't just like leaving clues that like just make Batman go from you know one action set piece to another but like something where he actually has to think and consider and like figure out like what what the criminal is trying to accomplish um with some sort of like cool twists i think that like a uh, mystery would be definitely something that we haven't seen in a film batman before and i think it would work pretty well i think a lot of people could be impressed and have fun with something like that Victor Zaz or Calendar Man? Maybe. Maybe. The Dark Knight showed him as a detective more than any other movie. It did. It did. He he was figuring stuff out, but it still... It wasn't quite a mystery, per se. It was more a movie about, you know, like... Uh, you know, life in the big city and, like, you know, the... the how... Public perception and politics and crime all sort of merged together.
there the intersection between all those areas and how it makes uh, things work or not work Will you be watching the HBO Watchmen series? Uh, I don't have HBO right now, so I guess not. Um, maybe someday. Maybe. But not right now. Just, uh... Yeah. I can only sort of afford so many services. And I don't have cable right now, so... I, I don't have a lot of interest in um, getting uh, HBO... I mean, I do because they always have good programming, but I don't because I don't want to spend that money right now. I didn't think I was going to finish this, but I'm so close now that I might as well. The car looks great. Well, that's very kind. I think it would be good to make a Batman period piece movie set in the 40s or the 50s, so it wouldn't be so James Bondy with all the gadgets and technology, says Jalopy Joe. Not a bad idea. Yeah, period piece Batman would be really interesting. Finish it. I will, Sheldon. The shine makes it look really glossy. That's what I'm trying to do, and then this is a blood splatter. So, I think I have to try to color some of it now, and we'll see if I can uh, make it look convincing. And I'll just be up a little bit later editing. And the episode will come out a little bit later. Uh, but it'll all be worth it if this looks cool. Not really, but it's what I want to do right now. there I would love a period piece says let me be honest yeah it makes sense do I have any artistic influences we all do we all do uh, I would say some of the ones that like uh, are, are, are motivating me lately are all Mike Mignola I've mentioned many times uh, I, I think that like um, there's something with, between like Alan Davis and Brian Hitch that that, that I like. Um, what else do I like? I like uh, the dark, shaded work of uh, like Sean Phillips on books like Criminal. I like Sean Gordon Murphy for like how he approaches technical detail on like vehicles and buildings, and his harsh angles on people. So 
so those are some. Eduardo Riso. I do like Eduardo Riso. He's a good uh, artist. I haven't seen um, I haven't seen his work too much since uh, I finished reading 100 Bullets. What's uh, what's his latest? I wonder. Does anyone know what they've seen uh, Eduardo Riso do lately? That dude's talented. Pretty sure he's an Argentinian artist um, because I think I remember reading an Argentinian vampire comic uh, back in the day that he uh, worked on. It might have even been called Little Vampire Boy. It's hard to remember because that is going back like something like more than 15 years. To... Christine never needed a sequel, I guess. You know, it, it kind of told a complete story, and horror movies always sort of end on like, ooh, what if it's still alive? The villain's still alive. But I don't think it necessarily really needed or would benefit from a sequel. That said, I won't be surprised if they remake it at some point soon. I mean, Stephen King's pretty hot property these days, isn't he? Eduardo Risso drew the Grim Knight. Okay, I don't know that. That one's that one's uh, something I'm not familiar with. Bust out some uh, colors here and put a little bit of color on it, and then I can uh, feel like I've accomplished what I need to accomplish. Pet Cemetery was unwatchable. What that recent remake? I, I didn't see that one didn't look great. I have not read The Humans, sorry. Going to bed now. All right, good night, Austin. Thanks for jumping in.
Copics are a lot of fun to play with. Um, they can bleed a tiny bit, uh, so you have to be prepared for that. It's not as precise as coloring digitally, that's for sure. And then they might be a little flat unless you really know how to layer them with, you know, like uh, grays and stuff like that, or other colors behind them. But they're fun. Uh, it's very fun to sort of color in, especially your own work. And because they can be like layered, you you can like sort of slowly learn and experiment with how to get more out of them. I added a lot of uh, glossy highlights on this, which will make it a little trickier to sort of color around all that stuff, but that's okay. Nothing wrong with the challenge. Do you ever think about using your sketches for t-shirt prints? Uh, no, I have to admit I've never really considered that. Did you sell a car that you wish you'd bought yourself? Um, no, not yet. Um, I'm not ready to buy quite yet. I, I, I just haven't found the right car. And I found, I've sold cars that I really think are cool, uh, that I like, but I don't necessarily think that that meant that they were right for me. The cars that I sort of fall in love with the most are the ones that are like you know not in my budget I'm like if I go in like something like a BMW M4 I'm like oh this is really I like this I, this is a cool cool car um, I like driving manuals but I like driving them for a little while I don't think I'd enjoy driving a manual every day if like that was the only option that I had I think I'd probably stop having as much fun with it. Maybe someday if I'm lucky enough to retire and I can have a car for fun and a car for like doing work, that's when I'd get like a manual. Um, but otherwise I don't think I'd want one for my daily driver. Uh, I remember the car. Um, I think that starred uh, James Brolin, maybe. Does anyone remember The Wraith with Charlie Sheen? It's another, like, sort of evil car movie. There's a bunch of them out there. Um... The worst is probably Maximum Overdrive, directed by Stephen King himself at the height of his cocaine-fueled life. Uh, he, he, he admits that himself. It, it's not a movie that makes a lot of sense. Some machines come to life, and some don't for some reason, so the, the logic of its world doesn't really hold up to much scrutiny. The best thing about Maximum Overdrive was the Green Goblin Semi. Yeah! Oh, rubber? Yep, that's, that's a possessed evil tire. Was Maximum Overdrive intended to be a comedy? I think that it was intended to be funny. I think overall, like, it, it was still meant to be a horror movie. I don't think they really accomplished that. I do think it was supposed to be tongue-in-cheek with plenty of what they did on it, but, yeah, I don't think it was intended to be a flat-out, like, 
we're poking fun at horror movies now. Like, they were just trying to have, like, funny lines and ideas within it, but... Uh, not a big success. That said, sometimes I wonder why Emilio Estevez didn't become a bigger star than he uh, either was or is, uh, however you want to define it. Just because, like, when you look at him in some a lot of his early movies, something like Repo Man or, you know, even a lot of the Brat Pack movies, the guy has a lot of charisma, in my opinion. Um, and it's just kind of funny that he didn't necessarily remain an A-list actor uh, or anything. Like, he, he just sort of... He, maybe he, that was his own decision. Maybe he just preferred to, like, you know, work more as a director or something. But, uh, I don't know. He was like, you know, he, he has a charisma to him. Yeah, Free Jack. I, I didn't really care for Free Jack. There, there, there's plenty of movies he made that weren't that awesome. But, uh, I don't know. Just something I, I was thinking of when I saw... Um, uh, Repo Man in the theater uh, not too too long ago I mean it was several months back now but I was like this guy was kind of a big deal in, in, in the uh, early 80s weird little thoughts that I have when I'm drawing not not too important how about lawnmower man oh that was a bad one Hello to uh, Eric Liberty. Hello, Justin Jacobs. Um, yeah, Young Guns. Emilio peaked in the 80s. He did. I, I don't know exactly why. That's all I was wondering, you know? Let's just say I'm surprised sometimes that his brother, Charlie Sheen, was sort of the bigger star that like lasted longer just because I do think between the two of them that personally I think that Emilio Estevez is the better actor You're not really that late, James Sutton, all things considered. Just uh, having some fun coloring, and then uh, probably going to wrap this up as soon as I finish with my uh, reds. I think I'm only going to do red tonight, because I've uh, been doing the, the, the stream for a little while now. And uh, I do want to get you guys that Comic Tropes episode. Um, my intention is to finish editing it once I finish this. And uh, get that up within, I don't know, three or four hours. That's my goal. Does that look like the same red here? Like, I, I it's pretty, it's different to me, but I, guess, I don't know if my camera can really pick up exactly what the difference is. And yeah, maybe that's uh, too close. Oh, well. That's my fault for adding a blood spray ladder on the uh, on a red car it's a weird idea I guess I should have added it across the grill it's too late to sort of ink it properly now but that's where it should have been that would have made more sense I was imagining like this one tire hit it and kicked something up but uh might have made more sense if I drew blood splatter across the uh, grill like it hit somebody head on.
I can tell I'm tired because I can feel my left eye twitching a bit, which is just something it does when I'm tired. It feels very annoying, but I can feel it sort of twitching. The cool thing about the 1958 Plymouth Fury is all the chrome. Now that probably was, uh, at the time, if you owned it, just complete hell to keep clean and looking good. But uh, if you kept it clean and looking good, it looked really good. Give this thing nice uh, wax so that the, uh, the paint coat also shined. That was a nice match. White on red or white on or red on chrome. Pretty beautiful. Um, poor Charlie Sheen, I don't feel sorry for him. Uh, if I hadn't heard about an incident where he held a knife to his wife's throat. Yeah, yeah, he's he's a weirdo. He's a weirdo. The Crow Man, the dual headlights. Yeah, can you imagine how intimidating that must have been uh, if you were, like, facing one of these with those headlights on? That, that would be uh, pretty aggressive. Uh, they chose an interesting car, or they didn't really choose it. I guess Stephen King chose an interesting car for an aggressor. I mean, it's a beautiful car, but there's definitely plenty of elements about it that are um, aggressive in, in what could easily be swung into sort of a malicious uh, intent. I get it. I like drawing cars and trucks and uh, uh, motorcycles, but I also don't think I have the imagination uh, for uh, mechanical detail that somebody like Sean Gordon Murphy has. I'd, I'd love to develop that more. Uh, I think look look at his artwork in something like, you know, the, the current Batman Curse of the White Knight and his motorcycles, for instance, or his Batmobiles just things of beauty there's there's so much to it that feels grounded and realistic and yeah it's it's cool he's got a real knack for that like uh, of the artists out there today i would say that he draws the best um vehicles and for some artists that's a huge challenge for many artists drawing convincing vehicles is a massive massive challenge Have you watched Batman the Brave and the Bold? You know, the only one of those I saw was uh, that uh, musical episode they did with uh, the Music Meister. Uh, and I liked it a lot. It was funny and, like, the songs were pretty catchy. Uh, but that's the only one I ever saw. And the Music Meister. They brought that character into the um, like Supergirl and Flash universe, but they should have just hired Neil Patrick Harris and made him like you know the same guy. It was it was kind of a forgettable uh, character in live action. It was just a premise to make a, a musical crossover episode, which actually did have some pretty dope songs, I believe. The people that helped collaborate on that were um, the, 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 the actress uh, writer that like created um, Crazy Ex-Girlfriend, Rachel Bloom. She, she's a you know good musician. And I heard that uh, 
Lynn Manuel Miranda himself also uh, consulted. So those are two pretty um, awesome uh, musicians to work on, like you know, a superhero musical TV show episode. But uh, and they did have good songs. I, I thought, like the overall, like the songs were pretty good. But uh, Music Meister as a villain fell a little short. It, it wasn't where like anybody's focus lay. It was just that was that was the premise that just got everybody singing. Big meows. There were a few big meows. James Cura says, I didn't appreciate Brave and the Bold when it came out, but I love it more now. Definitely an underrated Batman show. It looked like they were trying to um, definitely like do a little bit of a throwback to the sort of Silver Age Batman uh, and have more fun with it, which at least was a different interpretation than everything else that we received. So I definitely give them props for that. And uh, sometimes fun and funny is uh, a really cool way to go with uh, superhero stuff. Looks like I've almost finished giving Christine her nice red glossy paint job. There we go. I don't think that looks too bad. If I had a bunch more time tonight, I'd probably go over some a lot of the uh, chrome areas with um, some some grays. Um, I think that that would uh, add a, a bunch to it. I don't have a lot of time right now, so I'm, I'm just going to do a little just to see. Uh, very relaxing. Tomorrow is Treasure. Any idea for that? I can think the Leprechaun franchise. Leprechaun would definitely be a good way to go for Treasure. Um... But I'll have to give it some thought. Like, there's got to be some other movies where, like, you know, somebody's, like, you know, just protecting uh, something that's really important to them or something. And that, that like, a horror movie with, with that kind of a premise. Um, off the top of my head, nothing else is coming to me. But there's got to be other, got to be other options. That's a tough one to think about. What else would there be? This marker has had better days. Let me see if I can use this end. A little bit. A little bit. I'll switch back here but yeah this pen's almost dead that's all remember the fog hell yeah anything by John Carpenter is uh, at least worth a watch Captain Jack Sparrow when he's half skeletonized yeah yeah that, that, that's not bad that's not bad I don't know if it's quite horror but there's an, a horror element there smog smog guarding his treasure Smaug. What up? Uh, uh, my name's Smaug. What's up? Smog in the house. I want to uh, do just a little bit more after all. I can't help myself.
What's the funniest thing in the world? Somebody tell me what the funniest thing in the world is. Because I don't know. Life. Yeah. You should layer the blood with a slightly darker red. Um, yeah. Well, you know what I can do instead, actually, is um, layer it with a gray, I think. I think that that could work. Yeah, that's giving it a darker sort of tint, but I may need to go even darker than this gray. Let's just see what this does first. You can always go darker, can't go lighter. Not easily, anyway. That's a little better. Thank you for the compliment, Francisco. Uh, the funniest thing is maybe Monty Python. With you there. Funniest thing in the world are mortgages or finances in general. Mm, Battlefield Earth. The German episode of Faulty Towers. I like that, Jojo. Laughing gas. Watching politicians get called out. These are all good. These are all funniest things in the world. Thank you. The aliens in Battlefield Earth threw out, uh, thought humans like to eat rats. Yeah. Yeah. It was a bad movie. It wasn't good. switch to a different gray and then I'll I'll feel like this is pretty much done. Just gonna use one more. Don't think I'm gonna bother coloring in this guy here, the, the detective in the foreground. I just don't think it's necessary really.
yeah I think I'll just leave it there um, if I had a really light um, red I might even color in some of these sort of glossy areas and stuff but I don't think I have a light enough red you know like I'd, I'd essentially need a pink and I don't think I have a pink let me oh I do have a pink okay hold on <laughs> I keep thinking I'm gonna wrap things up but I want to just do a little bit more say that that uh, might look slightly better all right I'm gonna call it um, center that up but that's the drawing for today uh, this was uh, the inktober prompt was tread and I decided to draw Christine uh, from the book and primarily really the movie uh thank you so many people for showing up it felt like we had a really good number of people in the chat room tonight uh some interesting uh, questions for sure um i'll try to like have some stories in the future i gotta think of like stories to tell and stuff like that um but uh maybe maybe i should have balanced the shot the shading out a little i guess but uh still uh you know nothing's perfect and uh I had fun, which is one of the most important things uh, about this, and I, and I feel like I did learn a couple things that I'd do a little bit differently uh, next time, um, which is also important because this is primarily a learning exercise for me. Uh, if you guys learn anything from it, you know, like, let me know. Uh, that'd be great. Um, but, uh... It was a lot of fun. It always is hang, uh, hanging out and talking with all you guys uh, and gals and, and anyone else. <laughs> I don't want to uh, uh, leave anyone out or exclude anyone. So uh, thank you all for, for jumping in. Uh, and uh, I will be back uh, tomorrow. Pretty late tomorrow, just so you know, because I'm working until at least 9 p.m. Pacific. So I'll probably be pretty darn late with tomorrow. But uh, right now, I'm going to go edit and wrap up the next comic tropes. So give me like three or four hours maybe. And uh, hopefully you should see that pretty soon. Uh, I think that's about what I've got left. Um, I had a great time talking to everybody. I'm going to take off. Keep reading comics. Bye-bye.